Good morning, good morning. So this morning we're going to talk about Parshas Bahaloscha in the book of Bamidbar and to catch everyone up on the uh, sequence of events. The Jewish people left Egypt, they received the Torah at Sinai, and now they are traveling and heading towards where? The promised land, Eretz Yisrael. And they're heading in that direction. How do they know when to travel? The cloud of glory, the cloud that hovers over the Jewish people, moves, and then they know to pack up and move with the cloud. How do they know when to stop? When the cloud stops, they stop. So they have a GPS, God, <laughs> God protection service that accompanies them. The original ways. W-A-Z-E was created during the desert. So that's how they know. So now they're encamped and God gives Moses directions on creating the menorah for the traveling Beit HaMikdash called the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And it's a very, very interesting directions that God gives Moshe. And God tells Moshe the following. You shall make, and I'm, I'm reading from the Parsha, you shall make a menorah of pure gold, and the menorah should be made of a single piece of beaten gold. Now, the menorah was not just what we make at home with our students at Hebrew school, a structure out of a few pieces of wood, or we take bolts and we glue it on a piece of wood. The menorah was very, very elaborate. It was gorgeous. It was big. It was beautiful. It had seven branches. Because remember, it's not the Hanukkah menorah, it's the menorah of the Beit HaMikdash, the menorah of the Mishkan of the tabernacle. And it had to be honed out of one piece of gold. And everybody asks the question and the commentators, why? It's very difficult. You have to be a master sculptor to mold a, an object out of pure gold and a menorah that's so intricate with such beautiful details. And it had to be made exactly as per the instructions of God out of one piece of gold. It had to be made out of one piece. So the, I'm not going to uh, harp or talk about this too long, but I did want to uh, take out a very beautiful insight. And the reason is, is because the menorah signifies light. You know when you say, I got it, your, your eyes light up and you look up, you go, ah, I got it, <laughs> right? Whenever you get a concept, uh, uh, the symbol is a bulb that flashes, that lights up, right? That's the symbol of knowledge. That's the symbol of, ah, that's what they meant. What's what the teacher said? That's what they were trying to tell me. So menorah signifies light, understanding, knowledge, education. What the Torah is telling us that the menorah was made out of one piece of gold is that when you are an educator, when you are a teacher, when you are a parent, when you are an influencer, you have to be holistic. You have to be wholesome, honest, truthful, one. You cannot be hypocritical. You cannot have a dichotomy. Okay, one day, oh yeah, this is what I think we should do. Oh no, morally, this is what I think we should do. Ethically, this is what I think we should do. Oh no, we, this is what we should do. You have to give a unified lesson, unified instructions, unified teachings to your students, to your children, to your, to your, to your, to your community, wherever you are. When you are an educator, you can't afford to change your mind every day when it comes to important issues. You have to uh, impart them properly, truthfully, honestly. And I think in today's culture, what's going on in the world, we can very much relate to this. How parents are fighting school boards, how school boards are fighting parents and saying, you don't have a say. And the parent says, yes, I do, it's my child. There isn't a unifying form of education. And this is a very, very big problem now in society, that there isn't a guidebook of how we are educating our children, our students. But when you look in the Torah, the Torah means mora, the Torah means teacher, 
That is the foundation and the barometer of all our moral and ethics. You're not, you're not sure? Look into the lessons of the Torah. You don't know what the right thing is to do? Look into the wisdom of God, the guidebook called the Torah, which rhymes with mora, which means teachings. I want to share a story that happened. A teacher, an elderly man, he was a teacher his whole life. He's like somewhere at an event, and a younger man comes over to him and says, Rebbe, Rebbe, do you remember me? He says, of course I remember you. You were one of my students. He says, so what do you do? He says, I'm a teacher. He says, you're a teacher? Really? What inspired you to become a teacher? <laughs> As I recall, you weren't one of the kids that loved school. He says, you know, you inspired me to become a teacher. Your honesty, your ethics, your, how you treated us with such dignity and respect, that inspired me to become a teacher. And he tells his elderly teacher the following story, that there was a student that came to school with a magnificent watch. He was from an affluent family. They gave him a beautiful watch. He was not from an affluent family, and every day he envied the watch. He was a young student. One day, when his friend wasn't looking, he snatched the watch off the, his friend's desk, and he hid it away in his pocket. After recess, the student of the, with the watch cried out to the teacher, somebody stole my watch, somebody took my watch. The teacher made an announcement. Will the student who took this boy's watch return it right now? You're not allowed to steal. Return it right now. Of course, the class is quiet. The teacher says, okay. I want everybody to line up against the wall. All the students were lined up against the wall. He says, now I want every one of you students to close your eyes. And I'm going to reach into every one of your pockets. And I'm going to remove the watch. And by closing your eyes, no one will know who took the watch. And that's what he did. He stuck his hand into every single pocket until he found the watch in one of the students' pockets. And he said, okay, everybody, open your eyes. And he returned the watch to the young boy. He never told anyone who took the watch. The elderly teacher looks at the boy. He says, what? I don't remember that story. He says, you don't remember that I was the one who stole the watch? He says, no. You know why? Because when I went around the row of students, I also closed my eyes. So I did not know whose pocket I took the watch out of. This is what the Torah portion is telling us. That when you are an educator, when you are a leader, when you, whether you're an educator of your own family, your own friends, in your own community, in your own little hemisphere, honesty, integrity, is not only for somebody else, it's for every single person. And you see the impact of a teacher whose honesty, integrity, he says, and when I saw what a teacher you were, yeah. I always wanted to be a teacher. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. you want to add something? Well, if you don't mind, I just want to share a personal story of something that happened to me last week that Please. relates to a special educator. So um, my children all went to Ramaz. I don't know if you are familiar with the school. Um, it's, yes, it's a very usual, familiar. Yeah. Okay, so they all went to Ramaz and my father, may he rest in peace, was a Holocaust survivor. And one thing that made him more than proud was the fact that all of his grandchildren has graduated from, from yeshiva. And so in his memory, we decided that we were going to uh, create an award that was given at graduation. And at the end of the day, we were, he was a Zionist, he was a, you know, a charitable, charitable man, so many wonderful qualities. But the one thing that I knew that he believed in was mentorship and educating the young people because he always believed that this was our future. And so 
I woke up one morning, I had my father's voice in my head and I, I heard him say, I don't want the award to go to a child. They're all wonderful and they all get many awards. I want it to go to the teacher, the teacher that has made a difference in the lives of these children that has gone above and beyond. And so what we did was we had the kids vote. They had a specific list of criteria and it wasn't enough for the teacher just to have taught them algebra or Talmud or anything. The teacher had to have made a difference in their lives. And I can't tell you the emotion that was in the room when they announced this teacher's name and the standing ovation. And it was a beautiful thing to see that these kids recognized that this one teacher had actually you know, made a difference in their lives. And just quickly to tell you the one story that I told them about my father, about how a teacher and educator can make a difference is that when he survived the Holocaust, he was on a train going from Russia to Germany. And he, he by fate, by Hashem, met his mother and his sister on that train for the first time they found out they were alive. Wow. Wow, wow. right? Yes. However, however, in, the, in that moment of reunion, my father had the strength of character. They were leaving for Palestine, what was then Palestine, Israel. They said, you have to come with us. He said, I can't go now. I'll join you later. How come? In his town, outside of Vilna, he grew up speaking Hebrew, not Yiddish. It was a Zionistic town, very unusual. He said, I promised 200 Holocaust survivors that before they went to Israel, I would teach them Hebrew. So he put his whole life on hold to teach them something, a skill that he had that they didn't have. So I just wanted to share that because it actually just happened that you know we were able to give the award this week and, and teachers do make a difference. Educators can make a huge difference in, in people's lives. Um, so. It's true, it's a, it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. Diane, you wanna add anything? Oh, I was so moved by everything you said, Paula. Really, thank you for sharing that. It was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. That on the train and every, oh, every Can you imagine, like, in the strength of character, because he believed so much. And I wouldn't be here if he didn't do that. Because right. actually, what happened is he never made it to Israel. He started dental school, met my mother on the first day of dental school in Munich. They fell in love. And here I am. If he went to Israel, I wouldn't be here. Wow. <laughs> so. Divine providence. That's and it. Hashem. Beautiful. That's it. That's it. Anyways, I thought I'd share. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, beautiful. Okay, Paula, you can now officially take over the class. <laughs> no, no, that is not my intent. I only want to learn from it's, you. It's, 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 Paula, I'm, I'm teasing. It's, it's, this is called a, discussion, a class of discussion and introspection and conversation. So well, your sister can tell you I'm not shy. <laughs> good, good. Uh, Diane, Paula knows my sister from the Upper East Side. That's so so I want to finish this little segment that we, uh, in, in, uh, to culminate this topic is that three things were made out of one piece of gold. The trumpets, which symbolize leadership because there's a trumpet that announced the prophets, they announced the Jewish kings, a trumpet is a sign of leadership made out of solid gold. The cherubim, remember the cherubim, the face of the little boy and girl on the top of the ark in the holies and holies, which symbolizes Torah. And the third was what we discussed, the menorah, which symbolizes education and scholarship. Because why these three items? Because we said it's very difficult to create an object out of pure gold but it's much sturdier and longer lasting. And there's nothing that can break off because it's all one piece. You know, when you have screws and attachments, they're weaker. When something is one, is, is one piece, it's strong. Torah, scholarship, and leadership is the foundation of Jewish life. You need Torah, you need scholarship, education, and of course you need leadership three pivotal parts of life, and Jewish life in particular. And when you have those three things based on, again, God's wisdom, you have pure gold, 
solid gold, you have a foundation that stays with you. So this is the Torah portion opens up with this beautiful idea. And um, I, I always I, I always love the menorah. You know, when I gave a class on Jewish Feng Shui, uh, I've said that the menorah was, I think, in the south of the temple in the Be uh, Mishkan. I, I forgot which direction. And I said, and that's a place where you would put your library, books, holy books, educational books, because the placement of objects in our home can replicate the placement of objects in the temple, where the menorah was, where the ark was, where the holies of holies were, and so on and so forth. Another discussion. But anyway, as we move along the Torah portion, we're going to come to something very controversial, but very, very insightful, which I think will be today the core, core lesson. And that is the story of what happens to Miriam. Who is Miriam? Everybody remind me. Miriam's well, mother-in-law, Rachel, no. The mother, the older sister of Moshe, of okay. Moses, Miriam the prophetess, like Diane said, Miriam's well. In her merit, they had water in the desert. And when she passes away in the future Torah portions, we're going to hear how the rock which traveled with them, this traveling fountain of water disappears because Miriam, when Miriam passes on, the well passes on. And there's a beautiful custom on Saturday night, right after you make the Havdalah service, there's something called, you go, the well, the Kabbalist write, the Hasidic masters write that the well of Miriam appears on Saturday night after Havdalah. So uh, right after Havdalah, my family has a custom. The girls go to the nearest body of water, which is the kitchen sink <laughs> or the refrigerator <laughs> water, and you fill up a cup of water and you call out the Erisha Miriam, the well of Miriam. You make a blessing and you drink the water. And it's, the, it's known in our traditions that this is healing water because Miriam's well would heal people. So you Never drink heard that before. Water. Pardon? I said, I, I never heard that before. Yeah, My yeah. son-in-law does something with like poking the eyes and the hips and the here and the there. I don't know what that is either. But I'll tell you what one. that is. That's something yeah. else. So this is the well of Miriam. And you say on Saturday night, if you drink this water, it'll heal whatever you need, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and so on. Now, Paula, what your son-in-law does is something else. Do you know that when you finish the Havdalah, right, there's a candle. And the person who makes Havdalah pours the wine over the candle to extinguish it, right? Right. And then there's wine on the plate because you use a plate. You don't want to mess up your tablecloth. At least in my right. house, I don't want to mess up my counters and tablecloth. And the custom is you take your pinkies, you dip it in the wine, you put it by your eyes and in your pockets. Yeah. In your pocket symbolizes a week of wealth. Parnassa, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And by your eyes, that being the soul, the extra soul of Shabbos leaves your body Saturday night. It's kind of a revival, you know, a revival. Right. And also you should have a week where you see good things and you okay. look and see the good. That's the, it's a custom. It's a very, yeah. Beautiful. But when they come for Shabbos this week, I'm going to one up them. And I have a new custom to add that you just Marishal told me Miriam. about. There you go. Marishal okay. Miriam. There you go. <laughs> so that's the custom. Thank you. So now comes at the end of the por Torah portion a very, very cryptic topic. I want to read you what happens and you tell me what you think. It's a very, very cryptic story. It's going to require a little bit of explanation. And I'm going to read what happens. Okay, but before I read the story, there's something else I want to share, I remember, that will tie this in better. You know that throughout Moshe's leadership, right, throughout Moshe's leadership, there were many trials and tribulations. Does anybody want to share any of the trials and tribulations he went through? Does anybody remember in previous Torah portions that he as a leader experienced? He was allowed the land of Israel. He wasn't allowed into the land of Israel. Very good. Right. Um, well, he also had to decide what to do when the Jewish people 
built the golden calf and how to handle that situation. And he defended them as opposed to siding with Hashem in a way, right? Yes, excellent. Right after they get the Torah, right? What happens? He comes down. Hi, good morning, Margaret. Good morning. Good morning. And, Sorry, and, and he sees them worshiping the golden calf. What happens when they come to the Reed Sea and, it, and the, uh, the, the Egyptians are chasing them? The Jews say, take us back. Why'd you take us out? We'd rather be slaves than die here. Right? Right. <laughs> and throughout the journey from Egypt through the desert, you have a lot of complaining going on. Why'd you take us out? We were better off in Egypt. Why are you letting us starve? Why didn't you let us die of thirst? There's a lot of kvetching and complaining among Jews. Well, nothing's new. <laughs> and Moshe, if you remember in the, in the book of Exodus, where we, we see Moshe in action, he's a strong leader. He's a powerful leader. He defends his people to his own detriment. And you see Moshe in a very powerful light. Now look what happens. The Jewish people are complaining. We have manna from heaven, they say. But guess what? We missed the taste of good old pizza. We missed the taste of a good pastrami sandwich. We missed the taste of real food. Now the manna took on any taste you wanted. You wanted to taste a good cappuccino? Tasted like cappuccino. Whatever taste you wanted, a good piece of turkey for Thanksgiving? Tasted like turkey. But the problem was manna had one look to it. It didn't turn into an ice cream cone. It didn't turn into a brisket. It looked like manna. And people by nature like to look at their food, enjoy the food, savor the food, right? Cut into the food with a nice cutlery, a nice steak knife. So they began to complain, we want regular food. But weren't they slaves before? I mean, they didn't have such a great life before, did they? No, but just because you don't have such a great life and suddenly become a millionaire, and suddenly you experience freedom doesn't mean you're not going to be a kvetch. There's different personalities. Some people that come from a hard life, now God, thank God they have a good life, and they don't stop kvetching. And there's some people that had a hard life and now have a good life, and they never complain because they remember how hard it was. There are different personalities. The Jewish people are no different. It's made up of all types, kvetchers, complainers, optimists, pessimists. What's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? Both of them fall off a building. The optimist says, 10 more floors to go. <laughs> so it doesn't exclude people from kvetching. Jews love to give a good and kvetch. You know, no matter how good life is. Look what happens now. There's a big change in Moshe. Listen, I want to read what happens. It's very heartbreaking. Let me read it to you. So the Jews are kvetching about the manna. Loi uchal anoichi, levadi, la se sefkola amaze, ki kaved mi meni. The im kacha, I'm reading in Hebrew first. Ata isoli, haragaini no harog, im matsasi chain be necha, the el er ebra asi. He comes to God and he cries out with tremendous pain. Look what he says. Why have you mistreated your servant? Why have I not found favor in your eyes, in you that you place the burden of these people upon me? Did I give birth to them? He says. Did I give birth to them? I cannot bear the people alone. It's too hard for me. If this is the way you treat me, please kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, so I do not see my misfortune. So basically, Moshe is coming to God and says, kill me. I can't take this anymore. Does this sound like Moshe to you? The Moshe we know? The Moshe said to God, take me out of the Torah if you're not going to forgive the people. Take me out of your book. Kill me. I don't want to be part of this if you're not going to forgive them for the sin of the golden gap. Moshe is saying, God, I can't take it anymore. Please, if I find favor in your eyes, take my life. 
I, don't, I just can't do this anymore, he says. Now think about it. This is heartbreaking to hear Moshe talk like this. It sounds like, to me, good old-fashioned burnout. No? Burnout. Moshe is burnt out. What's going on here? What is happening to Moshe? It's a terrible situation. You know, it lets us look at Moshe from a very humane way. We're forgetting all these years Moshe is human. As great as he is, he's human. And now he's at his wit's end. So what does God tell him? Let's hear what happens. What Saul saves the day, so to speak. God says to Moshe, appoint 70 men of the elders of Israel, elders and officers, and have them stand there with you. And I will magnify the spirit and they will bear the burden of the people with you so you don't have to bear it alone. So God says to Moshe, okay. I'm appointing 70 prophets, elders and sages who are going to be your assistants, who are going to be leaders with you, who are going to help mediate and handle the leadership of the Jewish people. And 70 elders now are a prophecy descends upon them. God realizes Moshe needs help. So let's just quickly analyze, and you'll see why this is very important to the next part of the story with Miriam. Let's analyze what happens here. So now he has 70 elders, scholars, leaders, and they're also prophets. Not as great as Moshe. Moshe is the number one prophet and leader, but they are under Moshe. So there's a very interesting book. I forgot the name of the book. I wrote it down, but I left, the, uh, I left the paper at home that discusses leadership. There's two types of leadership. There's something called technical leadership, and there's something called adaptive leadership. This book talks about leadership. What's technical leadership? Anybody know? I would when guess. When Marshall left, go I ahead, know. yeah. I would guess it's going through the motions and the steps of being a leader, but... Excellent. And when Moshe takes the Jews out of Egypt, he's a technical leader. God says to Moshe, hit the water, it's going to turn into blood. Well, Aaron hits the water. God says to Moshe, now tell the Jews to bring the sheep, the carbon Pesach, they're going to have a Pesach Seder, then you're going to go to the edge of the lake, you're going to cross the river, you're going to go here, you're going to go there. Technical leadership. God tells Moshe, Moshe leads the people according to the instructions of God. There's no, there's leadership, but God is running the show, so to speak. There's no decisions to be made. Now the Jewish people are given a Torah. They're given freedom. They're given independence. They're given the ability to take their intellectual capability and make decisions, choose right from wrong, choose wrong from right and live life based on the teachings of Torah. Now it becomes adaptive leadership, where God says the Jewish people and people in general now have to become independent thinkers. I'm not going to hold your hand to la, hold your hand and tell you sit here, stand here, go there, come here. I gave you the tools to live a life. When you come to the land of Israel, you're going to be independent people. You're going to have to work the land, open up businesses, and lead your lives independently based on the wisdom of Torah. So now what's happening is the people, though they were taken out of slavery, the slavery has not left them. They're still kvetching and complaining and, and and still have that slave mentality. And they don't want to be accountable. The minute Moshe says to them, well, you don't like the mana? Figure out something else. They go, it's all your fault. You forced us here. You did this to us. Why did you tell us to come here? Instead of being accountable for themselves, they're laying all the blame on Moshe. So Moshe now has to transition from a technical leader to what we call an adaptive leader, where he has to empower the people. Stop coming to the leader and saying, it's all your fault. You didn't tell me what to do, so I didn't do it. 
And then when he tells them what to do, they say, why are you bossing me around? I would have made a better decision myself. And I'm sure we've all heard this from our children, from our spouses, from our students, where on one hand you tell people what to do, then they blame, then they blame you. And if you don't tell them what to do, they go, why don't you tell me what to do? I would have done it right. <laughs> well, it's sort of like he has to inspire them. Which is the problem. Because right. A leader, you know, there's something a very, very painful that happened with the Lubavitcher Rebbe in the latter years, in the years before the Rebbe passed on. The Rebbe said at one sicha, one gathering, I did everything I could do, and now it's up to you. And the few thousand people who heard this from the Rebbe's mouth were in shock. In shock. What the Rebbe was saying is what Mo was happening now with Moshe. It's up to you, your leader. And this is, by the way, how you know that Torah is not a cult. Torah is not brainwashing you. Torah encourages free thinking, independent thinking, debates, mistakes, falling, getting up, rebuilding, revisiting, reparation, re repentance, growth. The mindset of the people has to change. And guess what? It doesn't change. I'm giving you just a preview. We see that next Torah portion, we read about the sin with the spies and the entire generation, except the women, because they didn't participate, pass away in the desert. And it is the next generation who enters the land of Israel. You know why it has to be the next generation based on Kabbalah? And we're not going to go into now. We'll talk about it in the, next, in the, in the coming, coming classes is because you see this generation could not let go of the slave mentality. They didn't understand how to take independence and use it properly. They're still telling Moshe, it's all your fault. See, we're stuck eating mana all day. Who wants to eat mana all day? I want my steak. I want my medium rear ribeye. I want my salada. <laughs> they cannot give up their dependence and their dependent thinking. And I think this is very important, it just as my own, uh, uh, that's not the opinion of the management, it's my own opinion. I think this is very important to see that the Torah is real life. The Torah doesn't smooth out the controversial issues, the problems. God could have written a Torah that makes everybody sound perfect, exactly right, wonderful, great. The Torah could have skipped this whole chapter and say, wow, the people were so fantastic. My children are perfect. They never talk back. They never complain. <laughs> They're happy with everything I give them. But the Torah wants us to see real life. And real life is challenging. Real life has issues, problems, and how to deal with them. And that's why it's Joshua who takes over and brings the people to the land of Israel. He was an adaptive leader. God says to him later on, we're going to read in the book of Joshua, he says to him, you have to be brave, very brave. And Rashi says, why very brave? Brave is brave, very brave. Because to be a leader of these people, you have to be very brave. Because you have to adapt your leadership. That's why Kennedy, <laughs> uh, the two Kennedys, Lincoln, they had adaptive leadership and people were never happy. They were assassinated. Mm -hmm. Example of adaptive leadership. Read it. Yes. When was the war that they, which generation had to fight a war after? Well, like they were when, always when, fighting a war, but Josh but, was, yes, yeah, sorry. No, but it was the next generation because yes. that was part of waking them up out of a slave mentality as well, right? Because you can't just sit there and take it. You gotta, you gotta, you know, think of yourself in a different way as somebody that can defeat other people. Right. So when the 40 now, after the sin of the Miraglim, which is not in this Torah portion, the sin of the spies, God punishes them. Remember, he says, now mm -hmm. you're going to be stuck in the desert for another 40 years. You're not going to be allowed into the land of Israel. What happens during those 40 years, the generation that left Egypt, the men and the boys over 13 pass away. Mm -hmm. The women who do, are not punished. So the, most of the women end up in the land of Israel and the next generation, the mm -hmm. children and the grandchildren are the ones who conquer the land of Israel. Because again, it was a new mentality. People who grew up free, 
are not people who grow up in slavery. Like they say, you right. can take the person out of slavery, but you can't take slavery out of the person. It's a metamorphosis right. of life. Right. A metamorphosis of life. So you see now what happens. Now, now we're going to start the story of Miriam. I hope we have enough time to do it justice because it's just outstandingly fantastic. I love Miriam. To me, Miriam is one of the greatest heroines of Torah and of our history and of our lives and such a role model if you look at her life, a role model. So what happens now? So now 70 prophets are walking around with prophecy, right? It's not such a simple thing. <laughs> and then there's two young prophets, Eldad and Medad, who begin prophesizing. And what do they prophesize? That Moshe is going to die, and who's taking over? Yehoshua. So Yehoshua, Joshua, who is the student of Moses, comes running to Moses and says, Moses, you have to put these two prophets to death. They are prophesizing your demise. And they're prophesizing my leadership. And that's like, how do you call it when you rebel against the monarchy? Um, sedition? Yeah, sedition. So you got to take care of this. So Moses, who's the humblest of all men, responds in a very beautiful way. He says, don't worry, you don't have to take up my cause. All good. Now, this story is very pivotal to what happens next. Is everybody clear what happens? Moshe says, you don't have to worry. <laughs> you don't have to defend my honor. I'm okay. Because actually it's true. He is going to die and Joshua is going to take over. <laughs> so the, the, the truth be told. Okay. So now what happens is this. I'm going to read it to you, but I'm going to read it in English. Okay, ready? <laughs> Miriam, the oldest sister of Moshe, goes over to the oldest brother of Moshe. So it's Aaron is the oldest, then Miriam the sister, and then Moshe is the baby. But to Daber, Miriam the Aaron. Miriam and Aaron spoke critically about Moshe. About who? Isha Kushit Lakach. The Torah tells us a very cryptic line, one line. Miriam goes over to her brother Aaron and talks about the Kushit woman whom Moses married. Who did he marry? Anybody remember the history? He married um. Zipporah. Quick, quick history lesson. Moses is the prince of Egypt. He was adopted by Bathsheba, the daughter of Pharaoh. Remember the princess? Right. She sees him in the river Nile, the Nile Delta. She takes him out. She adopts him as her own son. She calls him Moshe. His real name was Tuvia. Amram and Yocheved, the parents of the three, of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, name him Tuvia. Good, because he, he looked so... Light and beautiful, they named him good, Tuvia, Tov. She takes him out of the water and she calls him Moshe. Mimayim is Shiseu, which means taken out, taken out of the water. So she gives him a name. Note that the Torah calls him Moshe, not Tuvia. Note that. Note that the Torah uses her name, not the name of the parents, later on. Now, Moshe is the prince of Egypt. He's walking around. And he sees an Egyptian taskmaster about to kill a Jew, one of the slaves. He's beating him so hard he's about to kill him. Moshe looks right and left, kills the Egyptian taskmaster, buries him in the sand, saves the Jewish person's life, and runs away. Why does he run away? Because he hears that there's a price on his head. Paro gets wind of the fact that his adopted grandson, heir to the throne, just killed an Egyptian to save a Jew. A Jewish slave, the chutzpah. <laughs> it's like Hitler hears that his adopted son, Yamak Shemai now, killed a Nazi guard in the concentration camp to save a Jewish uh, inmate, prisoner. So Moshe runs away. He's a fugitive of the law. And he runs to Midian, to the desert. And there he haps upon Sephora whose father is the priest of all priests, one of the wealthiest men of his, of his area, if not the wealthiest. And he's so impressed by Moses, he says, marry my daughter Zipporah. And Moses marries Zipporah. 
And when God calls Moses back to Egypt to save the Jewish people, Zipporah goes with Moshe. It's her husband, right? And she, of course, converts when they get the Torah because she was not from the family of Jacob, so she converts to Judaism. So Moshe is married to Zipporah. Okay? That's how he meets his wife. Why is she called a Kushia? Why is she called Kushia means dark skinned or from the land of Kush? Paula, nice to see your beautiful face. Why is she called a Kushia? I was cooking before. <laughs> So the Rashi says she's called Kushia because the numerical value of Kush and Yefas Toa, which means beautiful, are the same. And just like you cannot deny when somebody is dark-skinned that they're dark-skinned, you could not deny the beauty of Zipporah. She was so gorgeous, no one could say, oh, it's beauty in, in the eyes of the Balder. Not with Zipporah. She was stunning. So Miriam and Aaron are talking about Moshe's wife. But why doesn't the Torah tell us what they said? And right after the story, Miriam is, is called into the tent of meeting, into the tabernacle with Aaron. God rebukes them. And Miriam becomes a leprosy because she spoke bad about her brother. She spoke about her brother's wife. She showed her brother in a poor light. But what, what the Torah doesn't tell us what she said, how she said it. Why was she punished? Huh. Cryptic enough? What does he what? say to them? My Moshe, he's the humblest of all men. He's the loyal, loyal person of all men. And God tells Miriam and Aaron, rebuking them, how could you talk against your own brother? He's amazing in every way. He's loyal, he's humble, he's good, he's kind, he's smart, he's my leader, he's my prophet, he's my this, he's my that. He sees me directly. He doesn't even see me in a dream. He doesn't see, it doesn't see visions, he sees me. And Miriam is struck with leprosy. Because remember, we learned that in those days, if someone spoke evil, Lush and Hara, they got the skin disease. It's not really the current modern day leprosy. We're calling it leprosy, but it's not leprosy as we know in 2022. It's a skin disease, a spiritual skin disease, even though it's physical, but it comes from a spiritual source. It's called Sorat. And that's the story. But the Torah doesn't tell us the story. So the commentaries jump in. What's the story? Remember when the two young prophets came and said, Moshe is going to die and Joshua is going to take over. And Joshua comes running and said, how are you allowing them to prophesy? Sipporah was in the room, the wife of Moshe. And subconsciously, without even realizing, she blurts out on the, and like she, in, you know how do you call it when you say it under your breath? Oh, woe to the wives of El Darumedad. Why woe to their wives? After the giving of the Torah, before the giving of the Torah, God tells the Jewish people through Moshe, the three days before the giving of the Torah, there's no intimacy between husband and wife. Everyone has to focus on the giving of the Torah. So everyone's separated from their wives. They didn't have intimacy for three nights or three days, whatever. After the giving of the Torah, God says to Moses, now tell everybody, Back to harmony, harmony, go back to your husbands and wives. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> You're free to go. Honeymoons are back. Intimacy is back. But not Moshe. Because Moshe, after the giving of the Torah, had to be ready in a second's notice to speak to God. Moshe, though living in the same house with his wife, he separated intimately from her. There was no intimacy. So what is Sipporah saying? Woe to El Darameidat wives, right? She knows that it's, it's, it's not the best wonderful feeling that you can't be intimate with your husband all the time. So she quietly, without even realizing what she was saying, subconsciously, you know, under, under, under her breath, she says, oh, I woe to their wives. So Miriam gets very, very upset. Our poor sister-in-law is being deprived of her mat matrimonial uh, love. Her harmony, intimacy with her husband. This is terrible. So she says to Aaron, this is what she tells him, woe to Tzipporah, nebach. What can we do? Let's see how we can help the marriage. And if she can't be intimate with Moshe, there'll be no more children from them. And we know children from Moshe are special children, you know, special souls. How could they stop having children? 
This is what she tells Aaron. But we derive it from the passage and Hasidic and Kabbalistic teachings and commentaries because the Torah is very cryptic about what really happens here. So God <laughs> says, you spoke against Moshe? Leprosy. For seven days? What happens to a leper? Who remembers from the previous Torah portions? Anybody remember? What does it mean when you have Torahs? For seven days, you are isolated from the camp. There's a special area outside of the encampment where you spend seven days repenting, contemplating what you did. After seven days, you get sprinkled by the Kohen with the special waters. You bring an offering, and you're good to go. So for seven days, she was left outside of the camp. Now this comes, now we're going the plot thickens. And God says to Moshe, we will, the, though you were meant to start traveling now, but because Miriam is in isolation, we are going to stay and wait seven extra days until she heals. Until she heals. It's only, why? Because she waited for seven days. What is it talking about here? What is God so telling And then he you? was permitted to his wife again for those seven days? No, they seven, were permitted uh, to, no, oh, no. Moshe, so is, while uh, she was, was, were they permitted to be together again, Moshe and his wife, okay, while so, she was in isolation? No, the isolation had nothing to do with intimacy for Moshe and Zipporah. Moshe actually was not intimate with Zipporah for a little while longer because God commanded him not to be intimate with Zipporah because of the prophecies that were in the ongoing interchange between God and Moses. Oh, I thought he got a buy. Because <laughs> no, no, but um, okay. also, uh, the, w w w there are many little nuances to the story, which I'm going to share, but one nuance, which we'll, we'll, we'll I'll respond to right now, is the commentaries explain that Miriam and Aaron didn't realize the potency and powerfulness of the relationship between Moshe and God. So it wasn't like the regular prophets. When Moshe and God were having daily conversations, the, God commanded Moshe to be separate from his wife because of that very intimate relationship with God during these few weeks or during these few days. It was probably a few weeks for sure. But in no way does, was God intention to estrange a marriage and a relationship, as we saw in previous Torah portions, how God does everything to ensure shalom bayit, peace between husband and wife. Remember our discussion? The white lie God tells to save Avram and Sarah. Mm -hmm. So we know that God's intentions were not, God forbid, to estrange a husband and wife. Remember, they're living in the house. This is not a pre-divorce thing. This is not when people mm -hmm. get separated to give them space. It's only a physical, int from having intimacy. I'm sure Moshe gave his wife a hug and a kiss. I don't think that was <laughs> the issue. It was so, more because he was receiving daily prophecies and seeing God face to face that it required a certain level of separation from intimate relations. I so, think that's what the story is telling us. Yes, sorry, go ahead. really stood up for her sister-in-law. And, yes, you know, the women stood together, and I don't think the men like that. <laughs> well, I don't know. What, which men? Moses. No, because look what he says to God. That's a very beautiful point. Not okay. at all. This is not, I'll tell you why you see this is not a feminist issue. So listen, listen what happens now. I want to just read this to you because it's amazing. Just read this to you quickly. Um, hold on, let me find it. Um, okay. Uh, by the Tebe Miriam. Now, Moshe is so upset about what happens to his sister. Listen to what he does. Vayitzak Moshe Hashem. Moshe cries to God, please, God, heal her. This is what, now, this is, the plot thickens. So Moshe cries out to God right away. He says, heal her. Please, don't take up my honor. I'm all right. I'm all right. So the commentaries jump in and say, when Moshe is crying out to God for the sin of the golden calf, for other instances, he goes on a whole tirade. 
passage after passage, save them if you don't save them, take my life. If you don't, then take my life. And here it's one line. Because Moshe, in these five words, conveyed to God the whole story. He says to God, please, God, please heal her. Four words. No more need be said. Because what is Moshe telling God? God, you know why I'm here? Because of Miriam. Let's go back to the story quickly, because it's very important. Miriam is five years old. I don't want to go over our time, but do we have a few more minutes, girls? Of course. Story? Of course. Miriam is five years old. They are living in Egypt. Let's go back in time. She helps her mother, who's a midwife. Yocheved is a midwife. Miriam, as a five-year-old, helps mama to deliver babies. Paro now knows there's going to be a Jewish leader who's going to overthrow his government, his monarchy. So he calls in the two famous midwives of Westport, or wherever, <laughs> of Egypt. He says to them, Yocheved, listen. I have a prophecy there's going to be a boy born among the Israelites that's going to usurp me. So I need you very discreetly to make sure that when, a babe, when you deliver a baby boy among the Israelites, make sure it's a stillborn, quietly smother it. Do not let any boys live. A few months go by and Paro's not successful. There's baby boys all over the place. <laughs> he calls them in. Ladies. You know that you just opposed the monarchy? You're liable for death? Didn't I tell you that I want those baby boys in an indiscreet well, way killed? Yechevet said, I, I, King, I, I'm really sorry, but it's out of my hands. By the time they call me on their cell phones to come deliver the babies, the babies are born and I don't know where they are. I have net to deliver a baby. These women are like animals. They just deliver in the wilderness. They don't even call me anymore sometimes. So how could I kill a baby when I'm not a there at the birth? You understand? She, she and her daughter rebel against the monarchy. This is scary business. They could have said, listen, self-sacrifice. I had to do it. If I wouldn't have done it, the king would have killed me. They refused to listen to the king. So now the king makes a new rule. Every baby boy that's born, throw in the Nile Delta. Don't wait for these midwives. Send the police, send the Egyptian capos, send the Egyptian Nazis, let them go kill those babies, not capos, they were Egyptian, baby boys. And that's what they begin doing. Now Amram says to his wife, Yocheved, honey, we cannot have any more children. We must practice birth control. There will be no more children born from us because look at the danger. And when all the Jewish people, the Israelites, see that their leader, Amram, who is the leader, is separating from his wife, they all separate from their wives. They say the same thing, honey, sorry, we can't have children. This is too dangerous. Comes Miriam, and she's five years old. She's a prophetess. She says to her father, Dad, I, with all due respect, you're worse than Paro. Paro decreed every baby born be thrown in the Nile Delta and killed. You're not even allowing girls to be born. You're worse than Paro. By making everyone abstain from intimacy with their wives, you're worse than Paro. Now girls are not going to be born either. Where is our future? So the Torah says, describes how Amram goes over to his daughter and he pats her on the head. <laughs> and he says, you're right. And he reverses his decision and now everyone starts giving birth. But it's very, very, very sad because his wife, Yocheved, gets pregnant with Moses prematurely in the three months early so that the Egyptian guards who keep track of the pregnancies don't show up at the door. She gives birth to a baby prematurely, but he's born beautifully, wholesome. There's a light on his face. They see he's special. They call him Tuvia. And then two months later, seven, eight, nine, six months later, three months later, the Egyptians are coming to collect the baby because she's giving birth now. They know, their, they know her due date, kind of. So they're waiting at the door. So she takes her beloved baby. You have to see what's going on. And you think of the mothers who had to give up their babies during the Holocaust. Right? Think of this. So she puts her baby in a basket. And she puts him into the Nile River. 
I want to explain what goes on here. Amram is so devastated by what happens, he goes over to his daughter, and instead of now patting her on the head, he gives her like a, the commentaries explain, he pangs her on the head now. Look, is this your prophecy? You prophesied we should have children? Is this your prophecy? He's so angry, his daughter's now six years old. At Miriam, she feels a tremendous, I'm giving you a whole psychological insight based on the Hasidic masters and the commentaries. I'm putting it all together. She is devastated by what her father just did. He literally like almost patched her, hit her, slapped her. Look, look at your prophecy. When uh, nine months ago, he praised her. He patted her on the head. He embraced her prophecy. Now he's saying, look what you did. Our son is going to be killed. Now, what was Yochevet thinking? She could put her son in the river in a basket. What does she think is going to happen? How is he going to survive? He's only three months old. He's going to starve. The waves will come and tip him over. If the Egyptians find him in the river, they're going to kill him. What, is she, what does she think is going to happen, Yochevet? Mm. But he's put up against the brick wall. Think again of the, of the parents during the Holocaust. They didn't know what was going to happen, but at least maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be a miracle. Now comes the plot thickens. <laughs> Miriam is rebuked by her father in a very devastating way. She's six years old. The Torah describes how when her mother puts the baby at the edge of the Nile Delta, and then, you know, the soft waves begin taking away the basket, she doesn't go home. Meirachok, from a distance, it says, and I'll explain to you why it says from a distance, she watches the basket. She sees it flowing down the river, and she walks along Meirachok from a distance. And what does she see? Who remembers? Batna, the, who we wants to film the story. Batsheva comes and takes the Batya. baby. Batya, sorry. <laughs> So the story goes, and there's many interesting insights, that Batya is in the river bathing. Other people say she was converting to Judaism. She wanted to take on the Israelite way of life. So she was like in the mikvah. And she sees a baby crying in the distance. She can't reach the baby. The baby's far away. So the Torah describes, she sticks out her arm. And a miracle happens, and her arm becomes like silly putty. Remember Gumby? Remember Gumby, the Gumby toy? You pull the arm and it goes stretchy, stretchy. And she brings in the basket and she sees it's a baby boy. Now, she's no dummy. Her father is the king. She knows about the persecution against the Jewish babies, the Israelite babies. She knows what is a baby doing in a basket. So she brings in the baby and the baby's wailing in hunger. So she calls in the nursemaids from the palace. Come, come, nurse the baby. The baby refuses to nurse because it's Moshe. Miriam is watching this whole thing unfold. Bat, Batya sees her. So she says, may I suggest a Jewish nursemaid? And Batya says, yes, absolutely. Who does she bring? Mom. Her mother, her mother ends up raising Moshe. So his, the Jewish mother, his real mother, ends up raising him and he becomes the prince of Egypt, named Moshe, and Batya saves his life and knows darn well he's a Jewish baby. <laughs> There's no secrets here. So Miriam, two things. One, she watched over him. Two, she made sure that what food was he fed? Kosher food, kosher milk from a Jewish mother. So when Moshe says to God, heal her, because I, first of all, who saved me? Miriam. Two, how am I allowed to now use my mouth to prophesy your words? Because my mouth never tasted non-kosher food. So Miriam is the reason I'm here. I would never be Moshe the prophet if not for Miriam. Had <laughs> not kosher food touched my lips, I could not be Moshe. Moshe had to be a pure soul. He was the light. He, the, me, Moshe, Ad Moshe, like come to Moshe. There has never been a Moses like the Moses of Mos of yesteryear. And each one of us has a part of Moses in us. That's how great Moses was. So Miriam is the one who's, who Moshe is is because of Miriam. She made her parents have a child. If not for Miriam, there wouldn't be a child born. She said to her mother and father, 
genug shein. You can't, you gotta have children. There is a God, I'm telling you. So Moshe is born because of Miriam. Moshe is saved because of Miriam. Moshe is fed because of Miriam. So all God, Moshe had to say was, God, please heal her. Finito. He didn't have to say more because it's all in those words. She's, <laughs> she, I am Moshe because of Miriam. I am Moshe. Is there, is there any evidence that, hello? Go ahead. Sorry. Um, no, no. Is there, any, is, is there any evidence that Miriam was like a descendant of Nina? Because she had the same kind of goading, you know, personality. Who's Bina? Penina. Oh, Penina. I don't know. I would have to look it up. You mean okay. like a reincarnation, a Gilgal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly. But usually the great prophetesses, based on my previous studies, but I'm not, I'm, I have to look it up, are pure Come souls. Most mm -hmm. of us are reincarnated souls. But people like Moshe, the Rebbes, people like that are pure souls. They're never wow. reincarnated. They live the fullest life. They don't have to come back. Interesting. Most, okay. most. That's why there's reincarnation because the soul has to finish its journey. It doesn't finish its journey. It comes back based uh -huh. on Kabbalistic teachings. But, but, but it's interesting because Queen Esther, remember, had the soul of Sarah, the matriarch. That's why she ruled over 127 nations. So sometimes there may not be a reincarnation, but it'd be sparks of that soul. Sparks yeah. could be either or, you know what I mean? But I will look yeah. into it for next class. A very beautiful question. I went to end off with one more beautiful thing. So why seven days? God says to Moshe, if then she was she was ostracized for seven days by her father for talking against you, how much more so seven days? So the reason she's seven days here is because seven days. She was estranged from her father because of his anger towards her. He rebuked her. So she stayed away. Merachok doesn't mean she was distanced from Moshe. She was distanced from her father. After he rebukes her, she's so upset that she stays away for seven days. And those seven days now are the same seven days that she stays away because she spoke against, so to speak, Moshe with Sephora. You understand? Now, you might say, how could God be so harsh with a prophetess, right? She's Miriam, but prophetesses, people like that are treated on a much higher level. What, what, what you and I, every time we, we, we speak Lush and Hara, we're not struck by leprosy, thank God. Or at least I won't speak about you, I'll speak about myself. But mm -hmm. someone like Zipporah has such a refined soul that the minute she even indicates any evil or gossip, boom, Taras. You know what I mean? It's like someone who's allergic. If I eat a peanut, nothing happens to me. A child who's allergic to peanuts, boom, they're going to get hives. The soul of Miriam, the prophetess, is so holy, the minute she transgressed, even in a more, in a very light manner, or even like, what? She didn't really transgress. She was really, really honestly trying to help her brother. She loved her brother. She saved her brother's life. You were going to even suspicious of her that she would even think ill will of her brother? But the minute she says something, boom, taras, because she's so holy and refined. So the holy you are, the more you're, you're, you're held to higher standards. Whether you like it or not, you're held to higher standards, you know? More sense. So, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the five words, El Na Rafana La, is that where it comes from when you want to hear yeah. It yeah. is. It yes. Is wow. All yes. right. I'm so happy I, that you said that. That's so cool. Yes. <laughs> and you know, sometimes less is more. Sometimes, you know, when you want to tell somebody something, you don't need a 400. Like my kids say, I got the message. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you just have to say, hell no, the fun no. You don't need elaboration. God knows exactly what Moshe is telling him. <laughs> <laughs> no need to elaborate. But God has a very, very uh, response, which we didn't have time, but I just want to read you God's response. God says to Moshe, if her father were to spit in her face, wouldn't she be humiliated for seven days? All the more so, let her be quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and afterwards she may be brought back. 
In other words, Moshe, God is telling Moshe about what happened with her father, how he rebuked her, and she was distant for seven days. And now it comes back here. She's God is saying to him, but that was seven days. This should have been even more days, but it's going to be seven <laughs> days. It's called the Kal V'chomer. It's whatever. You know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> uh, if the crime there was for seven days, how much more so? There should be even more than seven days, but we're going to just do seven days for the leprosy. That's what God is telling Moshe. So to end off, I want to end off with one more thing because I think this is the clincher. If you remember in the prayers, we read the six remembrances. And one of them is, remember what Amalek did to you when you went out of Egypt, um, um, and so on and so forth. And one of the remembrances, remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way when you came out of Egypt. So the question is, why would you want to remember something bad about Miriam? Why would God want us to say in the prayers, remember, remember Miriam? She got leprosy because she spoke about Moshe. But that's not what we're remembering. We're remembering how Mo Miriam saved Moshe's life. Remembering how Miriam was the one who enabled the Jewish people to leave Egypt. That's what we're remembering. That's what we're remembering. So we're remembering a good thing about Miriam. Not God forbid, oh yeah, she spoke about Moshe, she got leprosy. So when you read this, you might think, oh yeah, we're remembering her misdeed. No, no, no. Remembering what God said to Miriam on the way as you came out of Egypt. How Miriam is the one, because of her, we left Egypt. By the way, remember it's the song of Miriam, how she takes the timbrels and she dances with the women separately? Why? Why not dance with the guys? One unified dance. So you're going to say, you know, separate seating, like the Hasidim. No, that's not why. <laughs> Modesty. The reason is, the song of Moses was the song for the, for the nation. Her song was a personal song. Her song was the song of how she saved her brother, how she saved the families from not having children. When she went with the women and sang her song, it was a personal victory. It was her personal song. She says, now I deserve to sing a song. After everything that happened in Egypt, now this is going to be my time, my song. Your personal victory, her personal song, her personal dance. So sometimes you're victorious with a group. But then, you know, like a birthday, sometimes you have a huge party with your friends and family. And then you go off on your own with one or two people or your spouse or yourself. And you say, now I'm going to celebrate myself. I need my time to really digest and analyze my life. And that's what Miriam does. She says, now I'm going to sing my song. After all the trauma that I went through, I need time for me to decompress and sing my song. So ladies, let's all sing our song. Don't forget, it's Friday, 18 minutes before sunset on time. Light those Shabbos candles. <laughs> Give a little tzedakah. And the world can need light. That's what we all do know. We need light. We need gas prices to fall. <laughs> But Miriam oh. is truly, truly an inspiration to all of us, I think. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you, Frida. Thank you for a beautiful, beautiful class. Thank yeah. you.